Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 200. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And 200 episodes is a lot. That's a very special occasion, and that requires a very special guest. So I am happy to be joined today by one of my jiu-jitsu heroes, Claudia Duval. Claudia, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? And uh, I'm honored to be guest number 200. I didn't know that. That's interesting. <laughs> it's also my 40th birthday today, so it's a very momentous occasion. Over oh here. my God, really? <laughs> you didn't tell me that. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, you know what? It's. I guess it's just part of getting old. I sort of forgot it was my birthday. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's interesting because i used to get very excited about my birthday but nowadays like i don't even want to celebrate anymore it's just i get depressed when my birthday is coming yeah. <laughs> well that's that's the thing as you get older it's less about getting presents and celebrating yourself and it just becomes a i guess a bit of a, a less special occasion but i have a five-year-old daughter and she is very excited about this birthday she is preparing a big surprise party for me as we speak. I am not supposed to know about it, but she can't keep a secret. Oh. So. <laughs> yeah, kids are not great at keeping secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, especially at that age. Now, hey, I give you a bit of an introduction here, and I am going to guess that pretty much everybody out there who's listening to this knows exactly who you are. But just in case, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction and just tell everyone who you are and, and what you've been up to lately as well? I'm not good at this part of introducing myself because are we allowed to swear and say bad words? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Yeah, because like whenever, you know, a lot of people come up to me like, hey, can you record a video for your seminar and stuff? Or when I used to do a lot of seminars or, hey, can you record a happy birthday video for my sister, my wife and stuff? And I'm like, yeah, what do I say? And they're like, yeah, just say whatever, how many titles you want. And I'm like, I don't want to be an asshole. And I'm like, hey, I'm Claudia, three times world champion, because that sounds like an asshole. And I... <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I, I'm happy to give you an introduction then. I mean, you are you are Claudia Doval, like you said, the three-time world champ, a legend in the sport, in my opinion, very much an inspiration to my game. Oh my God, thank you. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> hey, and when I polled our community and I told them that you were coming on, they were very excited. There's a lot of things that we can talk about. I think a mutual friend of ours, Emily Kwok. Yeah, I never met her, but she she's awesome. I actually heard about her while I listened to her on your podcast, her and Dominica, she says some amazing words. And then I, I looked for her on her Instagram and she's amazing. And I, and I hope to meet her one day. Yeah. Emily is, is fantastic. She's a longtime friend of mine, also a, a three-time world champion as well. One of the original generation of, I guess, female jiu-jitsu grapplers came up on the scene and uh, won a lot of her world championships when the sport was still very much just becoming the mainstream thing that it is today. First, maybe we could talk about what are you doing today? I mean, I know that the, the pandemic has derailed a lot of our training, mine included. I would love to know what have you been up to for the, the last year or two while the world has changed? Yeah, we had a little bit of a talk, you know, before the podcast. And like I said, I didn't want to go too far into the subject, but I guess a few people know about it. But like I said, I don't want to go too far into the subject. I just want to say like a lot of people know about it. Those who don't know probably will research it. But the thing is, something, something bad happened. I talked about it. There was, you know, repercussion. I was attacked for a long time. And the thing is, I kind of like lost the passion I felt about jiu-jitsu because you start seeing things in a different way. You start seeing how... And it's not news because you see it happening every day. Like you see how society treats women who speak out. You see, you see it happening every day. But once you feel it in your skin, like it hurts different. Like it always hurt me, like seeing it happening elsewhere. And I was like, this is bullshit. Like, why are people like this? And like, it always bothered me. 
but like once you actually feel it like it hurts so much and i saw it happening to me i saw it happening with other girls in jiu-jitsu there were so many cases i'm not gonna name it but uh there were so many cases coming out and you see how society treats it like you see how the jiu-jitsu community treats it if there's like a big name involved you know like a guy a big name guy involved they are like oh no but he's a he's such a good jiu-jitsu player let's not get those things mixed up and and they they just act like not my problem yeah and people forget way too soon they forget things like really fast and it's not like I'm, I'm doing this, you know, as in a kind of protest. It's not like, oh, I'm not competing because I don't want to be a part of this. That That's not what I'm doing. It's like, I genuinely, <laughs> English is not my first language, genuinely lost my passion for jiu-jitsu, you know? Like, if there's one question that I, I get asked pretty much every single day, and my DMs is, why have you stopped competing? <laughs> and the truth is, I haven't even trained that much because I lost the passion I used to have for jiu-jitsu because that stuff hurt me so much that I, I don't feel the same about jiu-jitsu anymore. And I know, I'm very aware that it's not only jiu-jitsu. It's everywhere. It's every single place on earth it's every single sport it's it's work it's everywhere but since jujitsu is what i do or what i used to do and since it happened to me since i've seen it happening to other people that's what hurt me and that's what made me lose my passion and I'm at a point now in my life that I'm hoping that I regain the passion that I used to feel about jujitsu. Yeah, I I mean, of course, I, I don't presume to be able to speak on behalf of anyone else's experience, but we have a long way to go in this sport towards making it the sport that I think we all want it to be. Yeah, first, like, I feel that there's a lot of hypocrisy on jujitsu where, like, on one side, I think it's good that, you know, a lot of people are talking about equality in jiu-jitsu and let's protect our females, let's have more female classes and stuff. So a lot of people talk about that, but they're only talking about protecting females as long as the guy who assaults the female is not their friend or is not their idol. Because the second that their idol or their friend assaults a female, they don't protect the female anymore. So I feel that there's a lot of hypocrisy in society in general, but in the sports that way. I know that that's not directly related to the topic we're talking. I just wanted to get that out of my chest. But yeah, about the passion I used to have for jiu-jitsu, a lot of people used to come up to me and tell me like, oh my God, you're so dedicated. Do you train so much? Because even before I started competing, because I started competing late because uh, I only started, you know, competing seriously at the brown belt. So up until then for, um, let me see how many years... So for five or six years before I started competing, I was just training just for fun. And I would train, you know, two or three times a day, not competing. I wasn't competing. I was just training just because I loved it. And people would tell me like, oh, my God, you have so much discipline. And I was like, no, I have no discipline at all. I train because I love it. And that's what happened to me. I used to love it so much that I would train jujitsu the whole day. And now I can barely train. Like I will train like once a month. And it's something like if I couldn't train for a day, I would be mad, you know, like the whole day. I would be sick and I would wanted to go train. 
I would come back from a trip and I would arrive at 2 a.m. and I had to be there at 7 to train. And, and now I lost all of that. I don't, <laughs> I don't have that anymore. Yeah. And, and especially the timing, too, with this happening during the pandemic, when you lose the thing that you love and the world has kind of shut down a bit and you can't really replace it with anything else. It is very hard. I kind of stepped away from jujitsu, but because I was effectively isolated, I didn't really have much else to do. And it was it was a very depressing time, honestly. And I had previously relied so much on jujitsu to to make me happy and to give me focus, like you said. And I would get depressed if I couldn't train. And then suddenly it felt like a, almost like a bad breakup where now I didn't have this thing in my life and I had nothing to replace it with. And it it was really depressing for a while for me. And I'm guessing you had a similar experience, too. So back to the topic, because when the pandemic started, so after a month, that's when I spoke out. So it was a confusing time for me because both things were combined. So... At the same time that I was out of jiu-jitsu, I was, you know, like kind of in a very bad situation because I was getting, you know, a lot of threats, a lot of attacks for, you know, for speaking out. And I know I wasn't because in the beginning, people actually weren't leaving their houses. So I wasn't leaving my house. But for a good time, I was actually afraid of leaving because I, I was honestly afraid for my life. You know, for a good month, I was honestly scared. So it, it's kind of, you know, confusing because I had those two things happening at the same time. So I don't know which feeling belonged to each of those situations. Yeah, I, I understand completely. There's a, a lot of variables happening at the same time for sure. What have you been up to since then? I mean, were you able to replace jujitsu with anything else in your life? Or are you still at the point here where now you're kind of living between worlds? So for a while, I did train. So the year of 2020, for a while, we didn't have anything because everything was shut down. But around, I think, maybe July, things started opening up again. So I did train for a little bit. I actually had a fight. I fought BJJ Stars here in Brazil. And then I, I stopped training again. 2021, I think it was a harder year for me than 2020. And then for the year 2021, I think I maybe trained, I don't know, maybe 10 times total. I didn't train at all, I think. And I started going to the gym. Like I would go every day, which is not the same as jujitsu. So I was keeping, you know, active, you know, physically. But I had hobbies, but uh, I wasn't training much. I only had like hobbies. I always liked anime. So I started like collecting stuff, like doing some like kind of cosplay stuff. I noticed. I saw on your social. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. I was just, you know, like trying stuff out. <laughs> well, I guess it's like jujitsu. It takes practice to to get good at it. Some of those people who do that professionally, I, I am just shocked by what they're able to put together. It's almost like they have a full production crew in their house or something. It's crazy what they can make. Yeah. Some of them, they make their own clothes because like mine, like I bought the, the clothes like already made. So obviously they don't fit. Uh, perfectly but those people those professionals like they have the the clothes made so it fits their body perfectly they're great at makeup because i think like the cosplay stuff like if you're gonna look like the character you gotta have the makeup and everything so obviously it was just like to to have fun and stuff like <laughs> i was not very good at it <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I would ask you here on, on the, to the topic of jujitsu again, do you think there's anything as a whole that the sport really should do to prevent situations like yours where kind of things happen and people lose our passion? Because one of the things I've noticed as I talk more towards people who participate in other sports like wrestling and judo, 
those sports are much more developed. They've been around for a longer period of time and they have different governing bodies. I would be curious to know if you think there's anything in the sport that could be done to to improve it, to prevent situations like yours so that other people don't have to go through what you went through. Honestly, I don't know if they are more developed because, for example, you take the gymnastics and you take that case like with the, what is the name of that doctor? The Nasser? What was the name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember his full name, but I know what you're talking about. So I, I'm not sure if they're preventing anything lo- like this happening. Because like I said in the beginning, it's not only jujitsu; it's everywhere. And I don't know if there's anything they could do. I think like one thing that bothers me a lot, like I said, everybody turns a blind eye. Like I said, if it's like a, a, a big name guy, a big fighter, they pretend they're, they're not seeing, they, they try to make it smooth, like, oh, but it wasn't really him. It was his students, but like, oh, but maybe it isn't the woman at a fall. Like they, they try and make it not a big deal. Like they always try and play it like not, like even the big federations, like they don't make it a big deal they try and play it like nothing really happened yeah yeah and the argument that i hear people always bring up and you mentioned the exact same thing and i hate this is when people say well this person might have done something really bad but their jujitsu is really good so let's focus on what a great jujitsu athlete they are it's such a stupid thing to say this drives me mad, and it's not only jujitsu; it's in the artist world too. Like in music, like you get like a a rapper that bits a woman like twenty times, and they're like, I can't listen to the music of a guy who bits a woman, and they're like, but this music is fire! Like I don't care. Like mm-hmm. this guy is beating women. How can you listen to this guy? And it's, and it's like. Yeah, he might beat up women, but I like the song and I'm like, no, <laughs> like, yeah. I, like, I don't care. Like, how can you? And I, I, I can't like, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And I guess like, I, I can't understand how people like how it doesn't bother them. I don't understand how it doesn't bother them. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I had the exact same situation. One of my favorite bands of all time, I loved their music. And then one day there were some terrible accusations that came out against one of the band members. Um, in fact, not really accusations. It sounds pretty clear that this happened. And I just have not been able to listen to that band anymore. I just can't because there's too much baggage now. I can't listen to listen to this music that I used to enjoy. I certainly can't justify giving them money either, knowing that they've done these these heinous, horrendous things. It just it doesn't feel right to me. And I do see that a lot in jujitsu where people will say, oh, well, yes, this athlete did some terrible thing, but hey, can we talk about what a great performance he put on last week, right? I mean, it just, I maybe some people can can separate things out that way, but I certainly can't. I can't just put aside the fact that someone has done reprehensible things and just pretend like it never happened, right? To me, that colors the rest of their work. And it's just very hard for me to turn a blind eye to that. I guess some people can, but I find that to be really disturbing that so many people just seem to not care that these people in our sport, they might be doing these awful things and they never get held accountable for it. Yeah, we had like a very famous case here in Brazil about this guy. He used to be a goaler in a football team and he got arrested, but it's never been proven, but it's almost sure he did it because this woman was pregnant with his child and it's almost a hundred percent sure that he killed her and fed her to dogs oh and he was arrested not for too long because that's how things work in brazil and he's free now because i don't know i don't think he was in jail not even for 10 years and as soon as he got out, he was, you know, out playing football again until obviously people started giving the team a lot of shit for having him. And then he got out of the team. 
But, you know, there were people, there were fans taking pictures with him. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, are you taking pictures with this guy? Like, hey, that's me and the goaler. And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how people can, like, how can you be a fan of a guy who almost certainly killed a woman just because he didn't want to pay child care? Uh, and like, it's just something that I can't comprehend. Yeah. And I agree with you that this is, like you said, it's not just a jujitsu problem. This happens really all over the world. I mean, I've, I've seen this in offices, right? You see this in the news all the time. It is not just a jujitsu problem. Although I do think in jujitsu, we are starting to at least pay more attention to these kinds of things. And that at least I am thankful for that now these issues are coming to light, even if at this point people are still not taking them as seriously as I wish they would. At least we're making progress and people are talking about these things. And that I think is a step forward in in the right direction. But it, it's so important as a community, I think, that we do take these things seriously because this is why people lose their passion for the sport. This is one of the reasons why people drop off, especially women, right? I mean, uh, and that's completely understandable. If you're a woman in the sport and you see this happening, especially if it happens to to you or to a friend of yours, yes, it's very hard to keep your passion for the sport because all of these people that you thought were were your friends and they had these strong moral compasses, you start to learn about them that they're actually willing to turn a blind eye to a lot of things. And maybe these people that I thought I was very close to, maybe they're not the people that I thought they were, because how could they believe this kind of thing if they really are the person that I thought they were? Yes, I actually, I heard, you know, stories of, about so many women that actually started training. They went to something like this and they never, ever trained jujitsu again. So many women that have been through a situation like this. There are other women that have been through something like this and they kept training. And uh, it's crazy because there was a time, and I think that was, you know, last year when that famous, because I'm not going to say names, but I think people will know, like last year around, I think that was like July, August last year when like that, whole thing was coming out and a lot of women started you know like black belts you know they were not even involved in the situation but a lot of women you know they started telling their stories and uh they started telling that hey this actually happened to me too but i kept training and things have i say survived as in like survivors to abuse like um and I kept training, and, and it's crazy how how often this happens. It's, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, it certainly feels to me, and I don't have the data to back this up, but it certainly feels to me like this happens way more frequently in jujitsu than in a lot of other walks of life. And I, I remember when I was a white belt and, and even a blue belt, you know, I was still so young in this sport that I was just enjoying it and loving it. And I didn't know what was going on behind the curtain. But then as I got more experienced and I became one of the more senior people in our gym, I started to learn about all of the, the drama and the backstage issues that were happening at the gym. And I started to hear about these stories. And I realized that there are some really abusive things going on in a lot of these gyms. You know, I had I had been told and part of the marketing was that jujitsu is for everyone. And it's the martial art that will teach anyone to defend themselves against a bigger, stronger opponent. And I, I thought in my head that it was supposed to be much more inclusive. But I started to see this pattern of how women were treated. I mean, I remember there. <laughs> I know a guy who got kicked out of his gym because his instructor decided that he didn't like the guy's wife anymore and said, well, I don't like your wife, so you have to leave too. Like just really, really petty, gross, misogynistic behavior. It happens so often in this sport and it's very, very hard to call it out and draw attention to it because like you said, people get very hostile when you do that. Yeah, and it's not only abusive towards women, it's always also like abusive towards like the little guy. You know, like black belts uh, thinking they own 
the world and own like the the blue belts and the white belts you know the acting like they're so great and so like amazing and so you see like every gym has at least one black belt thinking he's you know like better than everyone <laughs> yeah definitely and it's funny because a black belt it's really just a piece of cloth, right? It's a, it's a $10 piece of fabric. The white belts never believe me when I say this, because of course, when you're a white belt, you don't have the perspective, but a black belt really doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, it, it doesn't really mean that you're a great person. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you're great at jujitsu in a lot of ways, right? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's just all the black belt is, is an indicator that someone out there, your instructor, thought you were good enough at this sport to wear a black belt. It doesn't mean that you're a guru and it doesn't, it certainly doesn't mean that you're a good person. But the problem is a lot of people, they get that black belt around their waist and they know they can beat up everyone in the gym and it goes to their head. And like you said, there's always that one person in the gym who they basically abuse that position of authority. And it's very sad because that's, that's the opposite of what a martial art is supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. And usually, like, you see that those who act like this are not very good. Like, you see, it's not that black belt who, like, wins stuff. It's never, like, you know, that person that goes to tournaments and is going to win stuff. It's never, like, Bushesha. I bet he's not an asshole in the gym. I bet he treats everyone nicely. I bet he talks to everyone. Is that, like, I bet, like, that, you know, the asshole black belt is the one who gets beat up by all the other black belts and he can only beat up the white belts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I think that's what it is, right? It's that bully syndrome where they're maybe someone, they just, they feel inferior or they feel like they're not good enough. And so they use the, the position that they do have to take it out on other people. And I, I mean, that's not just a jujitsu thing. You see this in a lot of other martial arts as well. I mean, there's something about putting on that black belt. It's a symbol of authority and people abuse it, but it, it does make me sad because now that I'm a black belt, you know, I, I look at these people and I think, man, I, I, we represent each other in a lot of ways. You know, we're all supposed to be ambassadors to this sport when you have the black belt. But some of these people are running around doing things that are actively driving people out of the sport, not just in terms of abusive or criminal behavior, but just being a bad teacher and a bad coach and a bad leader. It it drives people off and I think it hurts the growth of the sport in a lot of ways. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I think now it's still, but like a few years ago, jujitsu used to have a very, very bad reputation. Because I remember, because I started training judo before. I started in 2006. And when I was doing judo, I remember that uh, I used to have a very terrible image and jujitsu. And I had that because that's what all my colleagues from judo used to tell me. So I used to think that jujitsu people were dirty, were unpolite, were, you know, a bunch of animals. And that's where, where people used to tell me until I joined. And I, and I saw they're not a bunch of animals. That's not what's happening here <laughs> but jiu-jitsu really does have a very bad reputation mm -hmm. yeah it and i wonder if that's just due to lack of regulation and lack of maturity in the sport because like you said with judo i mean judo is not perfect either no sport is there's always going to be these terrible things that happen but at least in judo there's an international independent governing body and because it is an olympic sport there's a lot of eyes on it Whereas I think the thing about jujitsu is, even though it's it's very, very popular now compared to where it was, it's still pretty small in the grand scheme of things. You know, if you compare jujitsu to other sports, it's still relatively small and niche. And I think because of that, it escapes scrutiny a lot of times and people don't pay as much attention to what's going on as they really should. When you say popular, I, I have, you know, like a comment to say about this, because, uh, for example, if you get an Olympic judo champion, because the thing is, if you're an Olympic champion, because if you're a world champion in judo, everybody that does judo knows you. But if you're an Olympic champion, everybody knows you because you won the Olympics. But for example, 
I think that uh, if you get the most popular person in jiu-jitsu and the most popular person in judo, I think the most popular person in jiu-jitsu is much more well-known than the most popular person in judo. I think jiu-jitsu is it's better known than judo. That could be a good point, at least in comparison with judo. Jiu-jitsu might be a bit more popular or at least more in the public eye right now. I mean, because jiu-jitsu has this relationship with MMA and MMA has grown a lot. Yeah, I think so. Because of MMA, I think jiu-jitsu is much more popular. I think so. Yeah, could be. Well, and that might also be related to why some of the problems we have in jiu-jitsu do seem so pronounced because jiu-jitsu is very closely related to MMA. And MMA is another very male dominated sport, you know, it, it has its own reputation as well. And some of that might be bleeding over to jujitsu. And, you know, it, like I said, it does make me sad because at its best, jujitsu is an incredible activity. I mean, it, it absolutely changed my life, not just in terms of giving me confidence and giving me an athletic outlet, but also in terms of the people that I met. I met my wife through jujitsu. I've, uh, I bonded with my brother through jujitsu. We're both black belts under different lineages. Jiu-jitsu, when it's at its best, is just an incredible experience for everyone. But the problem is that if you stay around long enough, I mean, you're going to see some bad shit, <laughs> right? You're going to see some bad things. And the question then becomes, what do you do in that case? And what, especially if the other people in the community seem to side with the bad guy, you know, what do you do in those situations? That seems to be an increasingly common problem. I know that for me, a big part of why I, I lost uh, kind of some degree of interest in jujitsu is just seeing just the way that a lot of people behaved in the face of the pandemic and in the face of a lot of these scandals that have come out in the last few years. It just really kind of bothered me because to me, these things are incredibly important. And it bothered me to see that other people didn't agree that things like you know, taking care of the women in our sport and making sure that they're elevated and that they're given a fair opportunity and that they're given, you know, a, a chance at a justice. The fact that those things seem to be so hard to get in jujitsu kind of burned me out a bit. And I think you're probably in a similar boat. I would love to know, what would it take? What would it take for you to really rekindle your love of the sport? Do you have an idea in your head of kind of what's missing right now that you need back? Well, so I want to say something about what you said, like, because jujitsu as a sport is amazing because like, like I was saying before, like I used to love it. I used to train it morning, night, every sing single day. Like it is amazing. It, it did wonders for me. I love it. It's great. Like the people I've met, like the best people that I have in my life that are not my family, the best people in my life I met to jiu-jitsu unfortunately the worst people or the worst person the one that caused me my most horrible trauma that i'm gonna carry for the rest of my life i also met in jiu-jitsu but the most amazing people that i met were also through jiu-jitsu so yeah it is great but I don't know if there's something that could be done because you can't force people to do, let's call it the right thing, because you can't force them to, to see or to be decent, to do what you consider it decent. Because a lot of people have the, wow, but he didn't do it to me mentality. You know, a lot of people have the, well, but it's not my problem. Well, but it's not affecting me mentality. It's only their problem if it happens to them. You know, so it's hard to to say if there's something that could be done. I don't know if it's, if there's something that could be done. I think that's something that I have to do it on my own. I have to to try and find my passion because I know that people are not going to change because you've been seeing it for years, you know, people not caring about the, um, the problems of society, the things that people do wrong. They haven't cared. People only do the right thing when they are being watched or they think they are being watched or they only, they don't do something if it's illegal. 
because uh, a lot of you know terrible shit they would do if it was not illegal <laughs> so i don't know i think i think it's up to me to learn to deal with stuff to like i have to turn a blind eye to their blind eye like they're turning a blind eye to <laughs> to injustice and i just have to turn a blind eye to their blind eye <laughs> i mean is that a fair thing to expect of someone though right because if we know that there are things that we as a community could do better it, it's very hard to just turn a blind eye to that and just decide to accept it as it is and i think that's that's the challenge right is some people seem to be able to do that but it's very hard to do that when you're the one who's been targeted and you're the one who's been impacted yeah because like when i was being targeted I was just going through, you know, a horrible time. I was, like, staying home. Like, I fought a lot on the internet, you know. Like, people would come up to me. I would come up to them. You know, it's hard also to fight people when uh, there's no one to defend you. Because my friends, they're more, like, don't mind it type of people. They're like, hey, just don't read it, don't mind. And you try to do that when it's one, two, three, but then you get, like, 10 messages the same way it's hard not to mind but then on the other side you have a person who who has like it looks like there's like 50 people working for them mm -hmm. you know doing the job coming up to you and attacking you so it's hard not to mind and then when it's not to me when it was like that other famous case you know when people were like posting the guy and and i used to come up to to then and i was like you know it had just come out you know like mo had was just like you know infuriated by this case and you know like this and this happened he protected the students and this is happening and this and that and you know, pages were like posting the guy, like nothing happened. And I was going to the pages and, and I was like, hey, do you know what this guy did? And, and I was going like to every single page. And some of them were like, no, what did he do? Because like here in Brazil, like no one talked about it. And then I, and I would tell the whole story, like he did this and this and that. And they were like, oh, oh, my God. Some of them were like, oh, my God, I didn't know. Some of them were like, oh, my God, did he? But then, like, not care. And some of them were like, oh, but he didn't do anything. It was just the students. And I was like, no, he did. Like, he coerced one of the victims to go and withdraw a complaint. And they were like, oh, but, like, you can't believe everything you read. And, and I, it got to a point where I realized, like, I can't. I can't fight this alone. Like I can't, I can't be doing this forever. <laughs> so like, I just, I just stopped. Like I, I can't. It's like you said earlier. Yeah. There's a lot of great people in jujitsu. And you know what? Most people out there, they're probably fundamentally really good people. But the thing is, it really only takes one bad person to really mess things up, right? Yeah, sure. Maybe 99% of people out there are lovely, but that one bad person can do so much damage if you just leave them unsupervised. You know, you brought up a great point where when you get someone on the internet who decides they really don't like you, they're not going to just post one message and then disappear. They're going to follow you around and make you miserable and create fake accounts to harass you. You know, it's not like someone just leaves one negative comment. It's a constant stream of abusive behavior. And unfortunately, the Internet enables that. And it makes it really hard for people to speak out because there's a lot of trolls out there who will act that way and they never experience consequences for doing it. Yeah, exactly. Like... In the beginning, I was actually, you know, kind of scared. And I went to the police here in Brazil and they didn't do anything. I actually like, I, I got some like screenshots of like guys from my old gym, you know, like talking some terrible stuff about me. And I actually think they got called into the police station because they stopped, you know, for a little bit because like they, they would used to go everywhere. When I was mentioned, they used to go to posts and, like, say bad things about me. But I think they got called in, into the police station and they actually chilled for a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, at least then that's some degree of consequences that uh, that cooled them off a bit. But I, I hope that certainly doesn't start up again because I... 
I'm, I kind of have a feeling that it, it's a lot of emotional pressure to have to deal with that kind of negativity on the regular. And when you see that, because the one thing is a lot of that, some of these people post this publicly. So, I mean, I can see these posts, right? You can totally understand why people would be afraid to speak up about the bad things they see in the sport, because just look at how people get treated when they do try to make things better, when they do try to speak up, right? They get abused, they get attacked. Your story is unfortunately all too common, right? It's it's not unique. I have friends up here in, in the Vancouver area who have been through very similar situations and the same thing happens, right? They get attacked, they're made miserable, and ultimately they wind up walking away from the sport. And that's so sad because on paper, jujitsu should be the perfect activity for people like this, but we kind of ruined it. And that does make me very sad. I'd love to find a way to fix that so that we could bring these people back into the sport. Yeah, I remember because I used to be so excited to to tell, you know, females to, to train jujitsu. I remember because like, I used to, you know, see a woman in the gym and they're like, oh, what do you do? I do jujitsu. And, and they would be like, oh, I'd love to try. And I would be like, oh my God, you have to try. Come on, let's go try. Come on, I'll lend you. I used to, you know, always be like pushing women to train. And like nowadays, I don't have the courage to tell someone to go train. I don't have the courage to, because what if I tell a woman to go train and they go through the same thing I went through. I don't have that because I used to be very excited to, you know, tell people, tell every single person that I had the opportunity to like, hey, you should train jujitsu. Come on, come on. It's the most amazing thing ever. And nowadays I don't have, I don't have the courage to, to tell somebody to go train. Because, like, it's supposed to be self-defense, but how are you going to defend yourself from the person who is teaching you how to defend yourself? Because, obviously, he knows much more than you. Yes, yes. This is the topic of that. I think you we talked about this already, but there was an incredible article that Avery Clements wrote, uh, one of the reporters for the Jiu-Jitsu Times. Oh, yeah, I know her. Yeah, yeah. She's been on the podcast before, and the article was called The Call is Coming from Inside the Gym. And she talks about exactly what you just mentioned, which is that Jiu-Jitsu, in theory, is supposed to be this incredible martial art for self-defense and personal improvement. And pretty much everyone who falls in love with the sport does exactly what you talked about, where you're you're basically trying to recruit all of your friends and family into jujitsu like it's a cult or something, right? It, it gets yeah. very addictive and you're trying to bring everyone in. But after you see some of what happens to people, I, I agree with you that that's a valid concern. If I want to get a woman in my life to learn self-defense so that she can ultimately protect herself... I'm not so sure I'd recommend jujitsu anymore and not because jujitsu doesn't work. I mean, it absolutely works. Absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the problem is I know that by t training her in jujitsu, if I tell someone to train that I may be putting them in an environment where they might be more likely to get abused because like you said, right, it, it doesn't matter how good your jujitsu is. If your assailant is someone who's even better at jujitsu than you are, it's not going to help you. There was a, a famous incident up here where I live where a black belt instructor was accused of sexually assaulting another black belt instructor. And the woman who put forth the accusations, she put out a public statement and talked to, exactly about what you said, which is that, you know, she felt like she d couldn't even really go public with it because her whole job was to be this black belt female instructor that taught people self-defense. And she was not able to protect herself from another black belt instructor. And what she said was, you know, she was afraid to talk about it because she thought, you know, this is going to impact my reputation. How can I teach women to protect themselves if I couldn't even protect myself? And so when black belts act that way and they do these things, it really, really erodes the quality of the sport in general. And that's so sad because at its best, jujitsu can be such an incredible thing. And I just, I really wish that it could be that way all the time and that we could move past these problems. But like you said, it's just, it's such a, a hard thing. I don't know what to do about it other than to just say, 
We need to be transparent. We need to be diligent and we need to not be afraid to speak up and we need to protect the people who do speak up. Yeah, I think it's really important to speak up and I think like it should be more discussed. It, it should be like more open about this because like the assault, it's not only a physical thing because like what happens is like the impact is, is like emotional. It's something like that it stops you. Like, even if you could, like, even if you could overpower the person, like, you can't move. It's hard to prove that, like, to someone because you get a lot of shit, you know, for speaking out because a lot of people like, why didn't you just say something? Why didn't you fight back? Why didn't you can't like you literally can't move. And it and it's hard to explain that to somebody because like you can't prove that to somebody unless they're in your body because you literally can't do anything like I remember when was happening to me I couldn't move I couldn't speak I couldn't do anything I literally like I wanted to cry I wanted to die but I couldn't do anything I was a living I was alive but I couldn't do anything and it's hard to explain that to people because it's not only a physical thing, it's like an emotional thing. So it's not only like about, you know, like the, it's not a physical thing. So like what this woman was saying, it's not like, I understand she was embarrassed to go public, but it, it was not like, oh, it's my job would be pointless. Because it's not, because it's like a... When you get assaulted, it's not about the physical thing. Because the other instructor, I bet you was like a friend to her. It was someone she was not expecting to attack her. So it makes it all the more difficult. Like it, it's, it literally stops your whole body. Yeah, yeah. You're exactly right in your assessment. It was uh, a person that she knew quite well. And that is the the unfortunate reality of a lot of these situations, right? I mean, it's, it is not that likely that you're going to get attacked by some stranger in a dark alley. It's far more likely that it's going to be someone that you knew and you trusted. And that's what makes it so hard to deal with because it's not just the, the physical assault. It's also the psychological betrayal of not knowing the people around you. You know, you, you put your trust and your faith in someone and you believed in them and then they betrayed you this way. And that just makes it hard for you to trust other people in the future, because once you've been bitten that badly, how do you unwind that? How do you go back to trusting people when you've had such a bad experience? That's why I think, unfortunately, I think that we shouldn't trust anybody. And I think people should be, you know, they should be taught not to trust anyone, because had I been taught, like, hey, don't trust anybody, I think... I could have handled the situation better because like it was somebody I trusted blindly. So when it happened, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared. That's why my whole brain shut down and I couldn't do anything. And I, I think like, that's something like you should, you know, talk more to people about it. Like, Hey, don't trust anybody. And you should be prepared for anything in your life. So when it does happen, they have a reaction. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know that can come across sounding really negative, but I think you're you're right and you have a good point. It is. It, it is terrible. But unfortunately, I think that's like, that's like life because it's like when you see like mothers, I know it's terrible, but like when you see mothers that they, they don't let, you know, male relatives get, go away with their daughters it's terrible, but I think that's what should be done. Like, I don't think you should let, you know, older men, you know, uncles, friends of the family, don't let them alone with children. And it sucks because sometimes it just is just a nice guy. But like, you see so many terrible things happening. But so just don't, don't let older men stay in room with young kids so just and i i think that that's how it should be handled and unfortunately that's how i think like to prevent terrible stuff yeah i mean it's 
it's so sad to to have to think like that, but I get where you're coming from. And it's something that we've said on the podcast many times is that you should respect people for what they do, not because of the position they have. You should never assume that just because someone is a black belt, that that means they must be a good person. You have to evaluate people based on what you see them do and what you know they do. And so if you're seeing someone who's doing or potentially doing terrible things, you know, you never want to think to yourself, oh, but he's a black belt. I'm sure it's all fine <laughs> because there's, oh, yeah. a, there's a very good chance it's not. The belt means nothing really at the end of the day. It doesn't mean that you're a good person. And I think like you said, I mean, I, I hope that we don't have to live in a world where we can't trust anybody, but I do think that we need to really focus on transparency and accountability. I don't think like the... It's not like don't trust anybody. It's just like expect, like know that anybody could do something bad to you. Like, cause I've read, you know, like the stories of the young girls and, and I don't think parents should allow, you know, their teenage daughters to get rides from their teachers. You know, there's very nice teachers that just want to give a ride to their teenage students. But you see so many terrible things happening. And I don't think parents should allow, you know, teenage daughters to hang out with teachers. And I, you know, because I bet there's, you know, thousands of, you know, professors who are just nice people. But so many terrible things happening. So, and I think you just, you don't have to assume that everyone is a terrible person. But you have to assume that everyone could potentially do something bad. And unfortunately, like, just to prevent bad things from happening, you just have to understand that everyone could potentially do a bad thing. Like, Yeah, it's the, it's the old trust but verify thing. It's a terrible thing. Like, it's a terrible way of thinking. But after seeing so many terrible things, it's, it's just like, I don't know, like, what, what could we do, like, to to stop it from happening is like I see so many terrible news like any and it personally hurt me. Like when I see it happening to other people, it personally hurt me. Yeah, yeah. I I understand. I mean I I have a friend or at least a former friend. I had known him for over five years and I never for a second thought he was a bad person or that he was up to anything bad. And then one day a series of allegations came out against that person to the point where I I couldn't reasonably deny it. I mean, if, you know, if five different people come out of the woodwork and <laughs> independently make claims against someone, there's probably a good indication that there's something going on there. And I never would have expected that this person would have been doing terrible things like this. But after I, I learned more about it, I... I realized I had completely misread this person. I had thought that they were just a totally fine, upstanding person, but apparently it was all a mask, right? It was all a show. And one thing that that you learn once you start to meet these people is that the people who are the bad guys out there, they're really, really good at putting on a mask so that they can come across as the nice person. Oh, yeah. They're great at doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's like whenever whenever someone gets accused of something in the jujitsu community, one of the things people will always say is, but I met that guy at a seminar and he was so nice and friendly. So, well, of course he was. You were paying him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they actually said this about, you know, my case. They actually, no, he couldn't have done that because I met him in a seminar and he was nice to me. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like over a seminar that you were paying? Paying to attend, you were paying him to attend his seminar, and he was nice to you, really? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a strange thing. I mean, people think that because they met someone for an hour, you know, in an environment where they were paying the person, that they know all about what that person, who they are, and what kind of person they are. That's actually a psychological thing. It's uh, I believe it's called the halo effect, where people, they have a good perception of a person based on just a quick transaction, and then they think, well, the person must always be like that. But that's not the case, right? Anyone can put on their best behavior for an hour if they're being paid to do so. The question is, what do those people do when the cameras aren't on and when they can do whatever they want to do? Do they still hold themselves to that high standard of behavior? And unfortunately, a lot of people don't. So I I think it's like you said, I mean, you know, yeah, of course, we all want to be a community and we want to trust each other. But you also have to 
have to verify that, right? You can never assume that someone is going to be a good person just because they were nice when you met them at a seminar. <laughs> yeah, of course. And like, uh, people really like, and I hear stuff like that. I'm like, no, he was nice to me. I met him at a seminar. I was like, you know, people were like telling me stuff like that. And I was like, are you for real? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, Claudia. It's, it is kind of a, an interesting time to be in the sport for sure. But the one thing that I am very thankful for is that even though there are a lot of things about the sport that cause us to lose passion, there are also people out there who are standing up for the right thing. I mean, I, I try to follow those people on social more than anyone else because I, frankly, I need to see that in my feed. I'm not interested in seeing people doing fancy jujitsu techniques anymore. I want to see people who are standing up and putting, putting their own name on the line to try to improve the community. And you're one of those people. And I mean, you're even before this, you know, your jujitsu story was very much an inspiration to me. You're definitely one of my BJJ heroes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you're most welcome. And so the things that you have done to to clean up the the sport and and to take a stand even though I know that it's ha come at a tremendous cost to yourself, it hasn't been in vain. I mean, I can tell you that here myself, my friends, a lot of our decisions and the way that we look at the sport are very much inspired by the things that you have done. So I, I cannot thank you enough for standing up, even though it came at a, a huge cost. I'm glad you did it. And thank you for everything that you do. Oh, thank you. But I actually, like, I, I didn't do it for, like, when I spoke out, it wasn't like, I wasn't like taking a, a stand or anything. It just like, it came to a moment where like, I keep in, I couldn't keep it holding it in because, you know, it was like killing me you know, holding it inside because I was like keeping it in for five years. And it got to a point where like, I was like, if I don't say anything, like I was, you know, I was physically, you know, getting ill from like holding it in. So I, I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this to myself. So it, it wasn't like, oh, you're brave and stuff. It was like, no, it's just, I physically can't keep that to myself. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Well, hey, I mean, I, I follow you on Instagram. If anyone else wants to follow you or check out your stuff, how do they go about doing it? It's uh, Claudia Doval JJ. Perfect. And I'll put the link in the show notes. So as always, I mean, I'm going to guess that most people out there probably are already following you if they're listening to uh... this. But, but if not, I'll put in the link and people can just click through and do that quickly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, fantastic conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on here. 200 episodes is a big milestone for us. I mean, 40 years old is a big milestone for me too. And I, I've always wanted to have you on here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday again. And I hope you have an amazing surprise party that you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know nothing about this. You know, my daughter is probably going to listen to this episode 20 years from now, and she's going to be very sad to know that I, uh, I knew her secret the whole time. <laughs> and she was like, oh my God, he knew about it. Yeah. Hey, also, you know, on the on the topic of, of good things in jujitsu, my daughter got her first stripe yesterday and she was very happy about that. So major milestone for her. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Claudia. Like I said, I greatly appreciate the time. Thanks for coming by. And of course, to everyone out there who listens to us every week. Thanks again as well. Hope you enjoyed this chat and we'll talk to you next time. Take care.